early exchange, shaping policy, advancing development. Let's look at global public debt as uh, there are concerns that it could be worse than it looks. What are the implications of rising global debt? Well, according to sources from the IMF, it says that global public debt could rise to $100 trillion uh, by the end of this year, 2024, taking it to about 93% of global GDP. Isn't that worrisome? What are the factors responsible for the global rising public debt? Token. Or speaking to this this morning, we'll have um, Gulan Olojade, who is a public policy analyst. He joins virtually. Good morning. Thank you for joining. Yeah, good morning. Nice to be on the program. And we're glad that you could find time to be part of it. Looking Thanks. at the report saying that uh, global public debt could rise to $100 trillion dollars, by the end of this year. It's, it sounds very worrisome, but let's look at the reasons for the rising public debt. Okay. Um, the rising public debt uh, issue aggravated uh, during COVID and post COVID era. Um, COVID brought the entire world to its knees. Uh, and it, it, from from that point, you, we started to see uh, countries pumping money into their economies to try and alleviate the problems that the people were facing because everywhere had shut down. Uh, post COVID, this spending uh required a demand for government to spend to be able to bring back the economy to stimulate aggregate demand uh did not stop so governments across the world continue to spend in a bid to uh stimulate the economy back into into action so all these spendings uh are now increase the rate at which public debt was growing globally and it, uh, it has attained uh, a, a dangerous level. Uh, of course, there are further complications along the line. You have uh, uh, issues of rising inflation, which is also linked to that same COVID and the spending associated with COVID uh, during COVID and post-COVID era. So all these issues are there. So while debt is mounting up, you also have situation in which the interest obligation on this debt are uh, further complicating matters. Um, so uh, that, that is the genesis of the rapidly growing global public debt situation. Are there regions that are more burdened with debts, even as it's a global uh, issue? Yes, uh, the, the usual suspects uh, are more burdened. And the usual suspects um, will be Africa. Uh, Africa and maybe African and the, and the Caribbean, the Latin Americans and the Caribbean. Um, those are the ones that are more heavily boarded. They are more heavily boarded because for a lot of these countries, the proportion of their revenue that is already going to debt servicing has become unbearable. Uh, they are, they are, a lot of them are recording what you even called net resource transfer. Net resource transfer is, is a situation in which the amount that these countries are paying as interest on their debt is more than the amount that is coming in, fresh fund that is coming in into, into those, uh, into those uh, countries. So you're paying more than you're getting in. So that is a net uh, 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 transfer of resources for those countries. So Africa is in serious uh, trouble with that situation. Uh, the, the Western countries have their own challenges, uh, but somehow because of the, um, of, of, of the long period of stability, because of the uh, uh, long period during which they have been able to build uh, a lot of safety net for their people, 
the, the, the long period during which you have built their own capacity to access the market and, and all of that uh, has made their own problem to be less. Then when you look at the interest rate, while the 10-year bond, the yield on the 10-year bond in Germany will just be about 0.8%, that is less than 1%. Uh, in Africa, the average is about 9.8%. So that is about, that is more than 12 times what Germany is paying is what the average African country is paying on its own borrowing. So this kind of wide gap creates additional burden for countries in Africa. You can imagine paying 12%, I mean, 12 times more uh, in interest by, by, by these uh, poorer countries. Now, looking at Africa and the Caribbeans being more burdened with death issues, what are the implications of being heavily burdened, most of resources going into debt servicing? The, the, the problem with that is that it will curtail growth. The money that they could have used to invest in infrastructure in things that would drive growth within the economy, they are forced to deploy it to meeting their obligations under the various debt that they have procured. So the, the direct impact, number one, is it will curtail the growth of this country and worsen their affairs. Number two, it will also curtail the capacity of these countries to intervene in measures that will, will help the most vulnerable in their society. There are governmental interventions that are meant to support this group of people, but where the, the, the interest burden on their loan is too heavy, and these are regarded as non-discretionary expenditure of government. That is, government does not have option. It must meet those obligations. So the, the, the other, the other uh, role of government that will suffer will be in, in things like the intervention uh, for the benefit of the most vulnerable society, uh, members of those societies. Essentially, if they are not able to drive growth or they, are, they, are, they have their growth for tail, they are not able to intervene to support the most vulnerable segment of the, of the, of, of the society, those societies will then end up becoming poorer as um, enough jobs will not be created, aggregate demand will fall, and generally more people will continue to slip into poverty in this society. Business people often say that borrowing is not bad, borrowing could be leverage, but why has that turned different for African countries that have borrowed? Yeah, borrowing is not the problem. Um, the number one issue is what did you use the borrowing for? That is the number one issue. Um, number two is that at what cost are you borrowing? Because that has a direct implication on the interest boarding for the borrowed form. Then apart from that is the issues around, you, you, have, you have issues around how these funds that have been borrowed have exceeded certain guidance limits. So there are limits that have been um, adjudged to be the optimal beyond which you are not supposed to borrow. So you have what you call the revenue to GDP ratio. Um, you also have things like the debt to GDP ratio and the debt to revenue ratio. So there are certain, these are ratios that are meant to guide how much you can borrow. But what we have found in Africa uh, and in most part of the heavily burdened countries across the world is that these limits have been exceeded. So people are going beyond their debt to revenue ratio, they are exceeding it. These countries are exceeding their debt to GDP ratio in their borrowing. And this has created an you know, because you have now defeated all the relevant limits that are meant to guide you and ensure that your debt is sustainable. Once you don't work within this confines, the debt becomes unsustainable, and the issue of 
death is not a bad thing, uh, flips over and death becomes a bad thing for such a now, in battling with this debt or trying to work with this situation, there have been calls by the IMF for countries to reduce spending. If you look at the West and what contributes to their rising debt level, the reasons are a bit different from what contributes to rising debt in Africa. I'll give an example, that of the U.S., high spending in security, high spending on uh, some interventions that the U.S. is having uh, out or intervening in other parts of the world. Now, when the IMF advise countries to reduce spending, it might be easy for the U.S. and some other countries to do that. But bringing that to Africa, if Africa is to heed to uh, IMF's uh, recommendation at reducing spending to be able to manage the debt level, what can that response be? Um, let me start from the, uh, the developed markets. Uh, a number of the developed countries are already uh, stepping down on the monetary tightening. So the U.S. is an example. Um, it is slowing down on the monetary tightening, which has prevailed for more than two years now. And it, is, it wasn't just uh, uh, the, the U.S. Several other developed markets tightened their monetary policies, interest rates went up, inflation was high. Of course, it was in an attempt to tame inflation that they started tightening those monetary policies. However, inflation has plateaued in most of these countries and has started to go down. Therefore, many of these countries are now easing those tightened monetary policies. When you ease the, the monetary policies, it gives you certain leverage to be able to uh, uh, um, tighten things on the, on the fiscal side. So it is possible for you to say, oh, let me cut down a little bit on the government spending. Because you are on the other side, you are already slowing down on the tightening monetary policy. So the fiscal side can help you to absorb those effects. However, in the case of many of the, uh, of the non uh, developing countries, if I take, say, in Nigeria, for example, Nigeria's inflation curve has, cannot be said to have plateaued yet. Nigeria, for example, had two months for, of, of, of a slight decline in inflation. And then by the third month, it went up again. And we can see how the monetary policy has reacted to that. So the NPR has gone further up to further tighten the, 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 the monetary regime. The implication of that is that you cannot be tightening monetary and at the same time strangulating on the fiscal side. The country will be literally as exited. So while it is possible for the developed country to start to cut down on spending, it is a bit more difficult for the, uh, 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 for the developing countries. However, there are still things that can be done. Developing countries now need to look at their cost profile. What are we spending on? And those things that represent wastage or things that could be deferred should be deferred. So deferred gratification, deferred spending on non-essential issues should be cultivated. This will help on the fiscal side to lower spending and create room on, on, on the fiscal side of things to be able to uh, uh, manage their debt profile better. We must, however, acknowledge that for most of these countries, there are huge spending pressure. There is a pressure. It, I'm, I'm talking of the genuine ones now, not the, one, the ones that are avoidable. There are genuine pressures to spend on health, genuine pressures to spend on infrastructure, genuine pressure to spend on, health, on, on, on education, and several other areas. So that pressure is not about to go down significantly, where we can make 
significant contribution is on the wastage and items that could be deferred. Uh, I, I think we are also overtly, uh, uh, overly optimistic about our debt situation. The developing country must come to grasp with the reality of their debt and stop being on, on, on duly optimistic. We have to get more realistic uh, with our debt situation. On 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 the last note on on, on on the last note, I would say we also need to consider issues about hidden debt in this in this uh, uh, country. Um, if if you remember a country like Nigeria, there was a time that about twenty three trillion naira in ways and means when were off the books. They were not they were not kept on the books. Um, so. All those kind of situations, we must ensure that we bring them on the books and have full recognition of such debt in, in, in the developing country. Issues around government enterprises that might post massive losses must also be considered. Those, those, those government enterprises, what are these losses, should be brought on books so that we have a total picture of the debt profile that we are managing. Now, for countries that rely heavily on debt to fund uh, projects and many things that the government needs to do, this is a time where we're talking about drop in revenue for a lot of countries. Nigeria is one of those countries uh, because the mainstay of the economy still is on oil. And we understand how the economy is open to external shocks. At this time, where revenues dropped and governments sometimes borrowed to shore up the deficit uh, to fund the national budget. Institutions like the IMF has had a review of its lending policies. Now, part of the reform package is expected to lower borrowing costs for its members by about $1.2 billion annually and reduce payment on the margin of charges and sore charges on average by 36%. What do you make of this? Do you see it as further encouragement to countries to continue borrowing if the cost of borrowing has been lowered and even the, the, the payments period duration of the loans have been expanded? Um, well, the way I see that is, is a measure to reduce the burden. The reality, which is part of what you said, is that there, is, there exists a gap. There's a fist, there's a gap in the in the budget of most of these countries. Those gaps have to be funded, which means these countries are likely to continue to borrow. If the rates at which they are borrowing, if the terms and conditions are harsh, then there will be a problem. And I will use an example that I used earlier. The yield on 10-year bond in Germany is 0.8%. The average of that same kind of bond in the developing world is about 9.8%. That is about 12.5 times what they are paying in, 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 in Germany. What that means is that if Germany should borrow money and the interest it pays is $10. If an, a developing country should borrow the same amount of money, instead of paying $10, it will probably will be paying about uh, $122.50. cover. That is phenomenal. That is huge. So definitely, I'm not saying that the, the, the developing countries can borrow at the rate of uh, Germany. I'm just saying, if there are concessions on the rate, it will reduce the burden of these people when they borrow. That, that is a very, a very important thing. But one other thing that I believe um, this institution also needs to do um, is to, you know, probably, you know, introduce certain measures into, uh, you know, a, a variation of what courses do they want to lend to. There are a lot of courses that they have lent to that one is beginning to wonder why should you give a loan to a country to, to, to prosecute a project like this. I've also read um, some reports, even from some of the lending organized institutions, saying that the, the, the purpose, the, the project they lent to, 
failed. And what came to my mind is, this is a project. So essentially, if it's a project, you're not meant to disperse the entire money at a time. So as you're disbursing the money, you are measuring the performance of that particular milestone before you disperse for the next milestone. So how come you waited until the end of the project and before you realize it is late and all the money has been consumed? So there, there is also reason to, for, for, for the lenders to change to, to vary the kind of courses that they lend money to. It might further help these borrowers to know that, look, if I approach these guys to come and lend me money to pursue this, I'm not, I'm not going to get it. Learn to courses that will help the, these countries to drive growth. Those kind of courses are better and they are likely to produce a, a result that will make repayment of those loans easier or possible or less burdensome on the borrowers. But as long as we continue to lend to any course that they approach us for, including courses that you know when this money gets there, there is no reasonable assurance that it will be applied for the purpose for which it has been uh, uh, procured. Why do you want to be part of such schemes and lending to such courses? The argument could be that that is a problem of the borrower anyway. It's, it's for the borrower uh, 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 to take care of those things. But as a lender, um, if you genuinely have the interest of these borrowers in mind, which I believe a lender should, at least from a private sector perspective, then you should be interested in what they use this money for. And if there's a reason not to lend to certain courses, then don't lend to those courses. Along that line, let's also look at uh, the suggestion or the recommendation of structural adjustment programs by the IMF as requirement for loans for some countries. How has that helped so far? Well, most of those structural adjustment programs have not worked uh, in most places. I mean, we've had structural adjustment programs in Nigeria as well. Um, what, what nations need to do is not to take the IMF template, hook, line, and sinker, and decide or want to implement just because you need money from them. And they say, go and do this, go and do this, go and do that. Uh, we've done it in Ecuador. We've done it in uh, Kazakhstan. If you are not Kazakhstan, you are not Ecuador. You must examine your own peculiar situation. And it is based on that that you make your decisions, not strictly based on what IMF or what those the lending institutions are giving you. Some of this uh, 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 situations are peculiar and there are peculiarities to the loan peculiarities to the region peculiarities to the causes of action so each country that is each country that is borrowing must have this at the back of their mind the mere fact that the lender is saying go and do this go and do that it's not a basis for you to just take it like that and go and implement you must examine you must review you must analyze you must situate it within your own peculiarities you must do all sort of scenario planning. If I do this, what will be the likely result? If result A is what comes out, how am I supposed to react? If the result is B, what will I do? If the result is C, and you are better prepared um, uh, uh, to, to know what to take, what to reject, and when you take this, this loan, to know how to deploy it, how to react to the response you get from the market. These are important. These are very important. <laughs> For this, uh, 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 in a time of very high debt burden, countries have begun to seek for debt relief. And in recent times, some countries in Africa, the Caribbean, have also gotten debt relief. Looking at Nigeria's own case, is there a possibility that Nigeria might get debt relief? Well... Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's for us to push for it. Uh, I, think, I think the possibilities are narrow uh, because debt relief come, comes with its own burden as well. And some of those burdens will involve um, certain expectation that you take some steps uh, uh, on, on the fiscal policy side, on the monetary policy side, on so many areas um, of, of policies. Uh, is Nigeria ready to take on those uh, uh, policies. That is number one. Number two, 
uh, they come with certain discipline that you also expected to be able to have uh, or present. Um, have we shown those levels of discipline as our spending justify uh, a need for for the debtor to want, I mean, for the creditor to want to forgive us? Uh, we need to look at some of those issues. When you drive a Rolls Royce to go and meet your creditor and say, um, um, here am I. Uh, can you please forgive me that money I was owing? Uh, a, 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 the creditor is going to look at you in some interesting way. Say, oh, okay, you're still, you know, you came here in a, in a Rolls Royce and you are begging me to forgive some of the money you are owing. Uh, those are areas, some of the areas of discipline that we need to be able to show that indeed we are serious about our financial issues, about financial management, about financial discipline, all this will endear us to uh, for 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 debt uh, forgiveness, but I, I think right. I think the chances are narrow. We should continue to press for it. If we look at Nigeria and some other African countries, these nations have so many natural resources. In fact, they have abundance of natural resources. And if we take a look at some countries in the Middle East, they also have some natural resources let's take a common one one that is common to african countries or common to nigeria and common to some countries in the middle east which is crude oil countries like uh saudi arabia and some other middle east countries have been able to sustain in that grow the economies and are even investing in other countries but if you look at a country like nigeria the country is struggling what have they done differently to harness the mineral resources that they have, that they are not struggling to, to the, the economy is not struggling as you would find uh, in Nigeria and some other African countries? Well, it is not the natural resources that you have that matters. It is what you are able to do with those natural resources that makes a difference. Um, other, there, might, there might be countries who might have less of those, much less of those natural resources, and they are doing better, much better than country with larger quantities of those resources. There are even countries in the world that have no single uh, mineral under the ground, minerals under the ground, and they are doing great and fantastic. So um, it's not about how much you have. Now, some of those countries that you refer to vis-a-vis -vis Nigeria have created the right environment for the exploration of this, uh, uh, this minerals, value addition to these minerals as well. And it's very serious discipline around the entire process involving this, this, uh, this natural resources. I'll give you an example. You mentioned Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, uh, nobody is hiring militants to go and sit on pipelines in Saudi Arabia because pipelines could be monitored with technology. Whatever makes it possible for Saudi Arabia to sit in a room and determine how much fuel, how much oil rather, is being produced across all the fields. But Nigeria is unable to determine that sitting anywhere. Those are the kind of things that make a difference between a country like Saudi Arabia and a country like Nigeria. The, the, the oil, uh, the national oil company of, of, of in, in Saudi Arabia is a much more disciplined institution that is accountable. That cannot exactly be said about our own national oil uh, 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 company. And this is not today. This is not a recent matter. Whether you're talking about the $2.8 billion uh, in the days, in the early days of OBJ, when it was military government, governor, uh, president rather, or whether you're talking about the Gulf oil money that we cannot account for, or you fast forward to the subsidy era in Nigeria, you will see those level of high unaccountability, dark 
hold of unaccountability by the, in the operations of the national oil company. That is totally different from what you have in the national oil companies of some other countries that are prospering by virtue of crude oil. Now, it is not uh, a, a, a case that is irredeemable. It is a case that could be fixed. It's a matter of changing a few things about how we run our own business. If the national oil is doing what, well, don't also forget how we spent 13 years in this country trying to create the legal framework for the oil and gas industry. In those 13 years when PIA, uh, when, when, when PIB remained a bill that could not be passed into an act of uh, uh, parliament, it delayed a lot of investment. It, it created vacuum in the system. So we were not making investment. If we were not making investment, how do we expect to be like a Saudi Arabia that is making investment on a continuous basis in its own, in its own oil and gas industry? So the investment were not being made. The regulatory environment was not particularly interesting. We have issues of oil theft that we have not been able to, we were not able to deal with for so many years. We are a country that at, at some point produced 2.5 million barrels of crude per day. And we went all the way to below 1 million. So instead of growing our own production, like some of the places you would like to mention, our own production was reducing and reducing and reducing all from 2.5 all the way to below 1 million. Thank God, I think we are, we are now uh, 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 marginally above, above 1 million. So there's a whole lot to be done to ensure that this gifting that we have, it is not just oil. We are even a gas nation. But all this gas, a lot of it are trapped under the, under, under the soil, under the ground there. Um, we are not able to bring them up. The investments are not coming as they ought to be. There's a lot of transformation that needs to happen in that space. I, I, I think we are beginning to retool again and see how we can transform that. Mm -hmm. And I just pray that this element of activities that appear to be uh, attempt to retool will be pursued with the discipline it requires and that it will yield the fruit that we need to deliver the goods for Nigeria. Wrap up, let's uh, look at the impact of the global public debt on businesses. What can countries do, a country like Nigeria for instance, do to help the plight of businesses? Well, uh, what, 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 the, um, what the debt body, the, the debt body does to countries uh, is that it actually uh, curtails their capacity to grow. So they are unable to make certain important investment that would drive growth. They are unable to support the vulnerable, which includes uh, uh, businesses, small and small and medium scale, or even micro, they are unable to support them because of the debt burden that they carry, or unable to support them as much as will be required to lift them up and help them become the right engine of development. Now, for for stay uh, in Nigeria, we need to continue to review the ease of doing business environment. What are those things that are curtailing the capacities of businesses to grow? What are those things that we can do to incentivize certain growth areas that we believe will help to achieve uh, uh, employment, uh, 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 the, the, the employment goals, uh, uh, revenue, growth, all the kind of goals that we have set for ourselves. What are those incentives we can put in place to help? So things around taxation is there. Things around tariff are there. Things around uh, the institutions that are responsible for approvers and the rest of it, how they conduct themselves. Things around corruption involved. Things around security are all spaces requiring intervention to ensure that we can transform or continue to transform that ease of doing business space. If you look at cost of borrowing in Nigeria today, it is crazy. I had a, 
a, a, a gentleman a banker uh, in my office a couple of days ago. And he showed me certain of his retail loans. Some of them are going for close to 40% uh, interest rate. And I'm asking myself, how many of the small businesses can borrow at 35% sustainably? Um, and and, and it, it, th th these are some of the problems. So issues around being able to provide, be able to intervene in that space and ensure that businesses can access certain loans that are at concessionary rate. I know that the federal government is intervening in this space, but hopefully we will intervene with the right level of discipline because we have seen interventions before that became abused. People went in there, took the money, did not pay back. Most of the people that took the money were not even the business, were not even the target. Some of them did not even have businesses. You know, So if we can implement this with, number one, we must fund it, and then implement it with the right level of discipline, ensuring that money gets to the real people who need this intervention. Then we can be sure that we'll get certain results that are positive from those interventions. Thank you, especially for being our guest on the show today, Bilal Lujade, who is a public policy analyst. Thanks for having me. Well, to businesses, do the much that you can ensure that your ears are close to the ground to know when there are initiatives that could help you access funds for your business. And uh, you could just uh, do more by trying to reach out to other business people. Do not try to do things on your own by becoming an island. Cooperation, collaboration is part of the key or factors that lead to success. I am blessing AHA. This is where we wrap things up on the show today. Should be sure to go over now to our social media platforms and like our page, follow, drop a comment if there is something you've got to say about the issues discussed today. Feel free, leave a comment and spread the word so that I 104.9 is here it's all about having a business partner that is there with you everywhere business markets insight comes up at 11 here on soup news tv the show returns tomorrow 8 a.m west african time i am blessed in aha you know what i will always do wish you a great day Early exchange, shaping policy, advancing development.